All right, then let's go live to Janet Phelan, who is in Mexico. She is the author, of course, of the book Exile, which I think uh, perhaps is why you're sitting there in Mexico. But anyway, welcome to Feet to the Fire, Janet. Thank you, James. Um, we're having actually a, a very stormy day here in, uh, in San Cristobal. Uh, the, the streets here don't really have... A, excellent uh, uh, system for, you know, getting rid of the water. So when it rains, uh, the streets become a little bit like rivers. So mm. this is what we're dealing with today. Um, I'd like to start, start off talking a bit about my latest article, <clears throat> which was uh, published at, on New Eastern Outlook entitled, The United States and Israel, A Dance of Deception. Part one. Part two is uh, almost done and will shortly be winging its way to Moscow for publication. Um, the, the article begins uh, discussing, as we brought up last week, uh, what is now being considered uh, the massive failure of the Iron Dome in Israel. As you may recall, the Iron Dome was intended to... Um, protect Israel from short-range incoming missiles, as, you know, like from Gaza or whatever. And according to Ted Postel and um, a gentleman named Richard Lloyd, who is with Tesla Labs, uh, Ted Postel is with MIT, the, uh, the Iron Dome is actually a dismal failure. Postel puts its, its success rate at about 5%. Now, the Iron Dome was originally developed by Raphael uh, Defense Technologies, I think it is. Raphael is in Israel. And the funding for the project was eagerly taken over by the United States. So um, this particular inc incident of the Iron Dome apparently being a worthless piece of junk, which both Israel and the United States are propping up apparently by a lot of uh, bogus propaganda, really goes, uh, I think, to the heart of what is the peculiarly dysfunctional relationship between Israel and the United States. And the article is developing basically a, a, a perception that um, from the beginning, the relationship between the United States and Israel, even before the establishment of Israel, it was the, the the relationship was fraught with uh, U.S. betrayal, sabotage, duplicity. In fact, um, Israel the whole the whole push uh, to set up Israel was in a very large part uh, supported by a group of rabid anti anti Semites, anti Jews, anti Semites. Now. You know, why? We've got to ask some questions here. Why would Israel push, you know, push and, and promote a, a missile defense system that doesn't work? Why would the U.S. also promote it and pick up its funding? What kind of nonsense is going on here? And um, what I am exploring in these articles is that. Um, we appear to have a leadership problem. We know we have it in the United States. You know, we see what our leaders are doing now. They're leading us over the cliff. But it appears also that the leadership of Israel is deeply involved in a similar betrayal of its own people. So, well, I think you can sum um, it up when you say the word eugenics. It's kind of got eugenics written all over it. Doesn't it, though? Yeah. So, so the, you know, the question is, why would the leadership of Israel be leading the Israeli people over the cliff? Um, and, it might be the know, job this, of this all gets, these leaders to do that. They're the Pied Pipers. It so. might be. It, you know. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. No, that, that was I, it. I finished. Um, I, it might be. It's just, that's their, their Pied Pipers. That's their job is to, uh, all right, you keep your people in line, get all you, all you can out of uh, as far as values we consider valuable and... Uh, Getting ready to be slaughtered, then we'll, and you will, we'll take care of you in the new uh, uh, whatever is to come. 
uh, whatever's to come, I think, is like six feet under. Yeah, well. <laughs> so I don't know how, how well they'll be taking care of us there. Um, I want to bring something uh, up as well because it was a little disturbing to me. Um, my article was uh, picked up and reported reported on by some other blogs. I mean, the article itself was also picked up and carried elsewhere, but it was reported on. Hmm. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm concerned about the reporting that was done, I believe it was the uprooted Palestinians. Um, I'm quoted, I'm, you know, quoted, the quotes are, are accurate, but uh, you get to the end and a statement is attributed to me which I never made in the article and have never made elsewhere. And um, then there's a quote, I guess, from my article afterwards, which I guess is meant to buttress this, but which actually says exactly the opposite. And I'd just like to read this um, here. Uh, Uprooted Palestinians state that Phelan claims that the Zionist entity benefited from the 9-11 terrorist attacks the most. I've never said that. And then here is the quote from me, which seems to say the opposite. The fact that the attacks of 9-11 were used as a rationale to go to war, first against Afghanistan and, and Iraq, then in a domino effect to attack Libya and threaten war against Syria and Iran, can only be seen as an effort to destabilize the entire region an effort which may have a fatal blowback for Israel. Now, that was my quote, and I, I did not state there or anywhere else that uh, Israel benefited most from the 9-11 well, terrorist here, here, attacks. Well, here, let me add this. For, if I'm listening, knowing that their conclusion, though, if I was listening to without their conclusion, it would be different. But knowing their conclusion, I think what you're saying is that they're looking in and saying, yeah, Israel benefited by 9-11 because they got to do all these wars, but it might blow up in their face. Well, you know, um, I think this is what this they're is, thinking this, it is. Well, interestingly enough, I attempted to post a comment on this website. I, you know, logged in and posted stating that I did not state this in this article or anywhere else, and my comment was moderated and blocked from publication. Well, after all, what so, do you know? Uh, it's only yeah. your voice. <laughs> I mean, this, this article is, is extensively quoting me. Interestingly enough, someone also made a YouTube video uh, discussing uh, my article. And, you know, I'm, I'm making some very uh, strong statements in here, such as, you know, the state of Israel was, at least in part, created by people who despise Jews. You know, and I have, the, I have you know, the... the the, the, the supporting documentation. So the person is on YouTube and he's reading this and he looks very puzzled, you know, because this, I mean, actually he wants to say all these bad things about Israel. And so it's like he's reading these things that aren't really even in con even consonant with what the the impetus is in his YouTube video. And he looks a little perplexed into the screen as he's reading this thing, you know, but then you get back to where Janet Palin says that, uh, you know, Israel benefited most from 9/11, and that is uh, well, you know, not I, my. That's not my conclusion. And I want to say so. Right. I want to say something here. I want to define Israel now. Is Israel the government of Israel, or is Israel the people? Because those are two entirely separate entities. And as we have seen in the United States, our government has essentially separated itself off from the will, and also from the benefit of the people and is in many instances actually attacking people. So um, I think we have to, to, to really define our terms. What is Israel? What is the United States? Are we talking governments or are we talking the flock, the people? I mean, I'm going to guess to say that they're, gonna, they're talking governments, but that also is propped up by the people who are blindedly following it. Well, my point before was going to be, you know, you mentioned about um, uh, Israel being set up, the state of Israel being set up by people who uh, don't like Jews. And you would think, well, why is that? They're giving their own place to go back in their, quote, holy land, unquote, and all this stuff. But if you think about it, if you wanted to get rid of the Jews, what would you do? Draw them to one place and then have a war. It's like a ghetto. Yeah. It's like the, yeah, it's the Warsaw ghetto all over again, <laughs> except it's called Israel. Yeah. So you draw them in there, and then you uh, set up the political system to to allow 
wars to be fought in that area, eventually spiraling out of control. And then, uh, you know, I guess if you're a, a West psychopath, you're killing two birds at one stone, the crazy Muslims and the just fill in the blank Jews, you know. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, I mean, um, just the effort to do all of this stuff. I mean, the karmic implications, the effort to do it, it's just beyond me. Just beyond me. The hate that's driving all of this, or the ego and or corruption. Well, you know, this brings up something very interesting. Um, something seems to happen to people when they ascend to power. Um, uh, the article that I'm working on right now, which is the part two of the Dance of Deception, uh, article is focusing on a United States Jewish agency and how uh, some I've, I've kind of caught them with their pants down in in a you know specific sort of focused uh, situation and uh, some of these people who are sitting on the board of directors for the U.S. Holocaust Museum have. Um, roots in, in they're Holocaust survivors, some of them. And, you know, a good example here is Professor Eli Wiesel. Now, Eli Wiesel uh, was involved in authoring the original commissioned report. It was commissioned by Jimmy Carter in 1978, and it was published in 1979, which advocated for the setting up of the U.S. Holocaust Museum and some other things as well. And I read the entire report. And Eli Wiesel, his statements of, you know, what he witnessed during the Holocaust, and he was a child at that time. You know, these are very moving and very strong statements. But when it comes to the situation that was brought to the attention of the Holocaust Museum, at which point they all went like those three monkeys, you know, see, hear, speak no evil, Eli Wiesel did the same thing. Now, we're going to be talking about this more in depth in the weeks, weeks to come, you know, what is this all about? You know, what did the Holocaust Museum actually do or not do about this? But this brings up, I think, a very, a very strange and, and sort of fascinating uh, uh, component of, of, of our collective plight at this point in time because you have individuals who have really survived atrocities and when they ascend to a level of, of power and impact they become perpetrators mm. so the question is you know I mean we've seen it before you know the, the, the hometown boy who runs for election and and becomes you know a congressman and then a senator and then you know and then becomes the wheeler and dealer that he promised he would never be you want me to throw a stab in there, um, or is this? Please result? do. Yeah. I have two working theories. Uh, one is that the people get lured or caught into doing something uh, egregious, whether they did they voluntarily went along uh, would be better, but also they could set them up and have a video to back it up, and now are blackmailed. And the second lot would be uh, though. Well, and of course there are people who who are evil to begin with and are attracted to it. I'm not counting them. I'm talking about the people that you're saying right. who start out. The second group would be someone uh, who would fall prey to negative entities. I would imagine the negative entities are attracted to seats of power. I mean, power is the gig. And so when you go into Washington, it's probably the most satanic cloud that you can walk into, and you start to be uh, chipped away at. Uh, and if you're not going in there like, you know, some... Some holy uh, sage going in to, to bring the light there. If you're going in to work within the power structure, uh, you would be open to uh, uh, some harassment and perhaps even uh, influence to bring you down the path. And then you can, at that point, you might slip back into what I said first. You might get involved in something that they have uh, blackmail on. And then the, the thing is so terrible that if you were to come out and say, look, I, I can't do this anymore, my conscience is bad. I got to come out and confess. It's so terrible, like a fantasy or some ridiculous, terrible thing. You can't ever come clean because you totally could not be forgiven by it. And that's why I think, uh, if I can add this in a little bit, uh, that when the time does come, when people are starting to be exposed, it's a good good time to try to attract them to the light, in spite of the horrible things they have done. Because this is my me talking. There is a, a period of grace coming that will. Uh, be, people who do turn away from their ways will 
uh, have an uh, expeditious regrowth into the light at this point in time. I know there's a lot of a lot of what ifs and a lot of like I guess I'll have to take your word for it's in there, but I just thought I would throw that in. Mm-hmm. It's hopeful anyway. Well, well you know, I, I, I'm very interested in what actually is the mechanism that that takes a a you know an idealist and somebody who is a who is wanting to make a strong positive impact on the world, but turns an individual like that into a. Uh, you know, forked tongue uh, uh, nightmare, okay? Um, I, I think that what you were discussing, which sounds like, you know, setting people up with porno and, and you know, and putting them in compromising positions and getting them on, on tape and so forth as one scenario is something, you know, that has certainly uh, impacted uh, a lot of, um, of people in Washington, D.C., and I think there may be other forces at work as well. And I'm not really sure, you know, I keep thinking, I keep thinking about the movie The Stepford Wives, you know. Um, like, I have seen people not only in terms of our elected representatives, but people who are involved in religious institutions and have a, a level of responsibility and obligation because of their position in religious institutions. I have seen them also, you know, show the uh, telltale evidence of that forked tongue monster. So it, it's, it almost seems to go along with the baggage of what happens when somebody ascends to a position of power. And it, it it's troubling. Well, you, it, you, you notice troubling. the people who are the uh, honest sages or whatever avoid power like the plague. You know, because it, it, it is a plague. Uh, as soon as you think you can change the world, you've already stepped into that realm because no one, it's not anyone's job or no one can change the world. All you can do is work on yourself and the positive energy that you create around yourself can leak out, if you will, and may affect others. But that's all. I mean, you can't, once you start, well, if we get rid of those people there, yeah, it'll... It, some die for the greater good. Now you see you've lost it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop the uh, break. It's because I can. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, that's what well, I'm thinking is I that think, pe- people, when they start to do that, uh, then you, well, you've gone on, when, you started people, on the slope. When people, I, I think that you really got a point here, right? that when people start to... Uh, position themselves as power brokers over others that they, you know, that they start to possibly uh, evidence uh, some of these uh, very unfortunate and and nasty behaviors. I think that, um, I mean... Yeah, well, I mean, that's the, the, the thing is, is, now, if someone doesn't believe in God... That's fine, but using God example, if someone God by definition is all knowing, all powerful, etc., does not interfere, does not intervene in a, a, in a, a proactive, aggressive sense for the same reasons. Because God, being more wise and a little more experienced than us, uh, it allows it to play out. Because the person who is power based will always fail, eventually. I mean, he might kill everybody around him. But then they'll be alone. I mean, there's always going to be a wall at the end of that. But a cooperative effort in um, enduring, uh, I don't want to say suffering, but I guess the, the old-fashioned word, long-suffering, I like that, uh, to, to, for the better of the good, all working together, you all win. You all, you know, it, it's, it's real simple, but people want a shortcut. They want to get, well, if we just do this, we'll clean this out here. It'll be a little nasty and dirty, but then... We'll be okay. You're never going to be okay, you know, because because now you've become what you want to to kill, to stick it out, and now someone will come after you, etc. Yeah, and this is this is one of the the problems with the paradigm of the violent revolution. This is one of you know the reasons I think that you know violent revolutions always end up producing the same uh, basically cast of characters that were needed to be overthrown in the first place. Uh, so uh, just simply perpe- perpetuating the paradigm. Gandhi was right in the nonviolence, but the problem was Gandhi was the leader 
the leader is killed, the movement dissipates. You see, this is why we can't have a leader now. We have to be our own leaders in our life, just like the effect the internet when it was designed was so that there was no center point. Well, of course, through various means now there are kind of center points, but so that any one part of the internet goes down, everyone else picks up the slack. This is what we need to have. We need to be um, uh, united amongst each other on principles so that all of the people are, to, there's no no one you can knock out. You have to knock them out, all of them, which, you know, they, they, may, they may end up trying. But uh, anyway, that's the kind of the model I'm looking at. Well, I like the model. So I'm I'm pretty much done with my segment um, for this week. The article again was United States and Israel: A Dance of Deception, Part One. Part Two is pending, and um, that's all, folks. <laughs> all right. If you that's can send me those night. links or anything pertinent, I'll put that in the description for the YouTube release of this. So once again, thank you for your work. Continue. Thank it. you for yours, James. Uh, well, we're I see we're all doing our parts. And it's working. So keep it up, and we will be back and talk to you next week. And uh, so take care. You too. Have a good week. All right. There we go. Janet Phelan. And uh, stay tuned next week. Remember, her channel's right here. You can subscribe to her uh, playlist and uh, get her every week. Could you feed your family for a year?